Hi everyone, welcome to another Hatton's Model Railway Skills Gas session. And this afternoon, we're having a look at water troughs, what their purpose is on the UK's railway system and beyond, when and where they were used, and of course, recreating them in model form too. Now we have them available as kits in double O gauge and N gauge, and we have a supporting range of buildings that are useful for them too. If you want to find out some more, do head over to the link in the description where you can see every model that we have available right now. But do feel free to ask any questions you have in the chat too, and we'll answer as many as we can throughout the show. But first, let's take a little bit of a look at the history behind why these existed, and then we shall go on from there. So we're heading back to the railways of the mid 19th century with services ever increasing, getting faster, running longer distances. Services were expected to run pretty much without stopping, really. But the main reason the locomotives needed to stop was to refuel either coal or water along the journeys. While some of the larger tenders did have enough coal capacity in them for the longer journeys, the water tanks weren't up to standard really for some of these journeys that lasted over two hours or so. So there was a great opportunity here to reduce the time spent stopping to refuel and increasing the reliability of services there too, but the design was needed to be brought in. So the London Northwestern Railway experimented with designs and came up with the design of the water trough that we see here. This was by the LNWR engineer John Ramsbottom, and the first was introduced in 1860. The concept, as you can see here, pretty much remained the same throughout the lives of these pieces of equipment. You'd have a trough in between the rails, which the locomotive would then have a corresponding water scoop, which would be lowered into the trough, the water, pushed up by the forces of the locomotive passing over this at speed, would then be replenished with water. So the first of these was introduced near Conway on the North Wales coast in 1860, and other companies took a little while longer to really reap the benefits of this equipment. The Great Western Railway installed its first water troughs in 1895, even though the London North Western Railway had put them pretty much all over its network by this point. Heading into the early 20th century, many of the companies really started to see what a great revolution these were and started to introduce them across their networks too. But they did come with their problems. You did need a flat section of line, so the line didn't, the water didn't flow one way or another down the trough and you did need a pretty straight section of line too, although they could be accommodated on some very generous curves. You generally found them on straight sections of line, as we see here in our prototype photo. Some of the other issues there as well is they were very expensive to maintain and build. With the action of the locomotive's water scoop taking place there, it did spread water pretty much everywhere, including the inside of the tender. This resulted in a lot of water being spread over the passenger coaches at the front of passenger trains. So it was customary for the guard to inform the passengers that they were about to pass over a water trough and then to close the window so they wouldn't get a early shower. And then, of course, as well, this had an impact on the maintenance of the track too. With that amount of water nearby, it waterlogged the track bed and, of course, caused some premature rusting on the track too. But heading back to the designs, these were pretty standard by this time across most of the companies with a lip on the top that you can see there to protect the water flowing out and also the start and the end of the water troughs, as you can see on this particular picture. There was extensive testing on these from pretty much their construction, and it was found that there wasn't really much difference in how much water was taken on between the speeds of around 15 to 50 miles an hour, with the more water flowing into the tender corresponding for the shorter time that the locomotive was heading over a water trough. The Great Western Railway apparently came up with a figure of 45 miles an hour being the optimum speed. Not quite sure where they got that, but anything between those speeds was generally found to be okay. 
you did only really find these on the main main lines with a lot of traffic running over them though with the expense of them the expense of keeping them maintained too they often did freeze up in the winter some of the railways including the great central railway did trial steam heating pipes underneath the troughs to keep them warm of course, you needed a water supply too, so something similar to a water tower that we see here was always nearby on the main line. And the main line maintenance costs, as we mentioned before, were also quite high for this. So some railways did without. Railways such as those in the south of England preferred to put larger tenders with larger water tanks on their steam locomotives instead of having the expense of the water trough but you still found them pretty much commonplace over the UK. Outside the UK, they were a bit of a rarity. We did see some on the east coast of the United States, as we can see here, but otherwise, generally, these were a UK invention, and there was around 150 of them on the UK network at the, type of, at the time of the grouping. Typically, every 40, 50 miles or so, but only on those main lines, as we mentioned. You'd occasionally get some other equipment along the line side too, including some of the signage indicating the start and end of the water troughs. And also in areas that have harder water, you would also have water softening equipment. But let's head over to the model anyway. This is great to reproduce right up to the 1960s and the end of steam in the UK when these water troughs were taken out of use. Some of them were used with diesels to replenish the steam heating boilers. But generally, you did find that these were taken out of use around the mid-1950s to the late 1960s. Some great questions there about length of these two. Thank you very much for asking those. Richard's asked that in the chat, as well as a couple of others there. Generally, these would be around 550 metres, so that's around 600 yards. That was, again, one of the optimum lengths of these that were found. You did get some that were shorter, and, of course, you got some that were longer. On some stretches of line, these led up to around half a mile long. Now, that is something that's not really easy to fit on a lot of double O-gauge and N-gauge layouts, but you can still create a representation of these with the Pico kit that we're going to be looking at now. I've got some measurements for the different lengths that you get of those two. So let's head over to that kit. Let's take a little bit of a closer look. I'll just bring the packaging in there so you can see the artwork on the front. I'll just pull the camera up so you can see that a little better. So as you can see, you get 760 millimeters there. I'll cover this in more detail. And of course, there is the images on the website too. You get the signage and also the equipment to put in the bottom of the pad. So I'll just show you some of the detail I've done here so far and different bits. I'll just give it a second for my camera to catch up and focus on the track that we're looking here today. I'll just give that a switch back so you can potentially get that so it goes into a little bit more high definition there for you. Let's give it another try. Yeah, I think that's done the trick there. So some of the equipment I've got here today, I've got my track already laid and already made. Now, you can put the ballast down before. I would recommend ballasting before you put these water troughs in. You can use them with pretty much any couplings, any M couplings and KD couplings. Just make sure that those couplings aren't hanging down lower than they should be. And you'll find no issues with these on your layout either. But taking a look at some of the parts. So we get the plas plastic sprues here. Now, these are the locating chairs that we can see to start off with. You get several of these. And as you can see on our track here, they are placed every two sets of sleepers that you can see. This is to support the water trough. And these are really, really easy to attach. I'll just go through the tools that I've got here today. I have a scalpel. I have an optional, and you'll see why it's optional in a second, pin vise and small 0.5mm drill bit. I've got a very important set of tweezers. And then I've got some super glue to hand there too. There are a couple of ways of attaching these to your layout, and I'll cover both of these in today's stream. So first of all, we're going to need to put some of those securing chairs down. 
So I'll move the board out of the way for a second. And then just taking the sprue, just separating those away from the sprue. You'll see on the sprue, there is a point where it ends just after the rail there. So we're just making sure that's fully cut away on both ends. Just making sure to cut away from the rest of the sprue there to avoid any damage to the rest of the kit. So there we go, very small part, but nicely detailed. You can see these in close up on our website. It's not the best thing to be showing on a camera screen here, but these are really easy to cut away from the sprue. Now there's a couple of ways you can attach these to your layout. In the securing look, there is a small piece for a small nail in there. You can use the likes of the Pico track pins if you have them, the SL14s. But you do really need the smallest track pins out there to fit these. The Hornby track pins, the Gage Master track pins, and of course the Hatton's original track pins are a little too large for this. If you are looking at doing that, however, get your drill bit. And then as if you were fitting track pins to your track, which is essentially what you're doing, just drill down into the track, create a hole right in the center of the sleeper. So you're the same distance from either track and you are the same distance from either edge of the sleeper there too. So you want to make sure that you are fully away there. Drilling down, twisting drill. Just cleaning up that hole afterwards. Just as we've gone through some of the cork and some of the MDF board underneath there. Again, if you're working with MDF, do make sure you're in a well ventilated area. So you've got that hole there to be able to secure them. I'm going to be going with glue today. You can glue these on too. And I'll be honest, I prefer doing it that way. If you do prefer pinning them down, that's entirely up to you and you can do both methods. Now, I'm sure some of you have heard this from me many times before, but my method with glue is always to put a tiny little bit on some scrap plastic or a scrap container that you may have. And then working with a cocktail stick, we just get a small amount of glue on there. That gives you great control over how much glue you're putting onto whatever part you need it to do so. So these are spaced every two sleepers. As you can see, I've got three in there already. And I will just put a little bit of glue down there. Again, this is a little bit fiddly, so I apologize in advance if it takes me a couple of goes. You do have a few seconds to work with the glue there. And of course, it dries clear too. Grabbing the top of our support. Just making sure that sits right on top, flat and sturdy, but also making sure it sits right in place to sit on that glue too. Might just need a couple of gentle prods to make sure it's going in the right place. And if you're not too confident with the glue, of course, you can pin these down as we mentioned there previously. I'll just take my fingers away there so you can see it a little bit closer. Great question there. I can't pull it up on the screen while I've got my hands busy, but asking regarding the water scoops on some models, I would recommend checking certain models. They are designed that they shouldn't catch with equipment like this. They are generally placed in the raised position, but do have a check of your models when they are going over some equipment like this. You may find that some catch, but they are generally designed so you won't have any interference on these particular items. So heading over to the next part, we pull our second sprue. And this is the actual water trough itself, as well as the equipment here that you can build yourself and paint up. That's the water trough signage that we see there, indicating the start and the end of the troughs. What we're looking at here now is adding in the actual troughs themselves 
as we can see them there on the screen. As you can see that they are right in the middle of our tracks. And that's exactly what we will be doing here. So I've got one piece ready. I'll just show you how these cut just to show how easy they are to put together. The hardest bit of this is certainly adding the little brackets that we can see there. So going again, finding our scalpel, you can see just where these are joined. Just make sure you've got the kit the right way up and then gentle bit of pressure there to separate this away. You'll feel the rather satisfying click of them coming free. Just pulling away there, pulling towards, not putting too much pressure on there. If you, if you watched our plastic kit building video, you'll get some more tips on separating the sprues that we can see. What you'll see now is there is a very small amount of the sprues still remaining on the separate parts. Now you can sand these down with a sanding block. You can scrape them away very finely with your scalpel there. Just put on almost the same angle as the sides, just cleaning those up. As said, you can use a sanding block too. You can use nail files, anything like that, just to make sure that there's no rough edges there that won't sit on the inside of our troughs. Joining these together, really easy indeed. You'll see again that there is a securing section there. I'll just secure these together for you now. I'll bring back our glue. And I would recommend placing every single one of the chairs that you need before thinking about putting the actual troughs together. As for the color of these, Grey is actually pretty appropriate, really. I'd do this before I'd weathered the track, and then these would go a very similar sort of brown or dark, gungy, muddy colour, really, at this time. So just putting enough glue on there on where the securing lug will join in, and also the ends there. So just making sure they join on. And then putting that down so we'll get a firm connection. We're sliding them together and just pushing them both together with quite a bit of pressure there to really get that bond to join. So it'll be glued on the ends as well as where that little securing tab is that you can see on the particular piece right here. So we'll give that a couple of seconds to join on there. We have used the correct part of the scoop you'll see that the kit has lengths that go along here as well as the end pieces there for the scoops and there are some measurements that i can give you for the particular measurements here too there's some great questions coming through in the chat thank you very much for those coming through you do have the water scoop still on a lot of the preserved locomotives although there isn't any of the water troughs for them to be used on they are kept on there for some of the heritage reasons just to say the locomotives are exactly as they were in real life and of course you can put a water trough on your preserved railway if you wish to make one of these work again now in the kits themselves the engage kit is ratios 255 product code and you can find the information on the bottom in the description there with that that's seven pounds 50 for the kit you get the signs and you get let me just check my figures there you get 370 millimeters of the actual trough itself so 37 centimeters or just over a foot and a bit in those measurements too when it comes to the ratio kit, you get 550, it's product code 550, sorry, and again, it's on the description. That's £9.50, you get 760 millimetres there, which works out in real life terms, about 60 metres or 200 feet in scale form. Obviously, a little bit less than that in 176 scale too. So those are the two kits we have available at the moment. We have a supporting cast of the water towers that you can see here. And of course, click the links in the description to find out some more. Anyway, I think we've had enough time for that glue to dry now. So let's head back to the workbench. 
And this really is the fun bit. Now we start to see our kit go together. It's not quite joined there too much, unfortunately. So I'll just be using the single piece here today. But this then goes into our trough, as we will see below. So I'll just get a very small amount of glue again, putting that right on the top of each of the chairs. Just making sure it's only a very small amount indeed. And then getting the start of our trough, just placing that. I'll try and give it a bit of a better angle for the the camera for you just making sure then that that places straight down into the trough as we can see a little bit of firmness required just to make sure it sits properly towards the end a couple of seconds to bond to the glue and there we go that's just starting to sit down there now you can at this stage start painting this once the glue's dried. I give it a couple of minutes or so to dry up. But once that has taken in there, you can start adding the water effects on the inside, maybe a dark gray or a dark blue color in there for the water effect. Maybe some of the water effects effects that we sell to. Or if you wanted to model them a little more empty, you can, of course, fill them with a distinct brown or gray color there too. But generally, you would find that they'd always have a small amount of water in ready for the next train to pass, as you can see here. So leaving the bottoms in that gray, maybe weathering them in with the track would look great, in my opinion. And you can also see there some of the effects they have had on the nearby rails. Just adding a little bit more, maybe mud and soil around this area rather than just your typical ballast would add for a greater, more realistic look here too. But that's really down to you. I'd have a look at some of the fantastic photos online of the water troughs out there past and present, not only in the UK up until the 1960s, but also in use in America as we see here with this particular locomotive. So I hope you've enjoyed today's session. I've really shown you the basics here, but this is exactly the same skills for both the double O and the Engage kits, building them up in exactly the same way, putting down your securing brackets first, and then locating the water troughs inside them, then adding a little bit of paint just to really make them stand out on your layout. It is something that's quite unusual. It is something that's only really for steam era modelers, but it can really make a talking point on your layout. You don't see them that often, and certainly I've not seen them that often on model railways. And they're a fantastic kit to start off with. You don't need a huge amount of skills to be able to build one of these and incorporate it on your layout. So I hope I've tempted you. If I have, don't forget to check out the link in the description down there for information on the N-Gage and the double O gauge versions of these kits, which we have available right now. If you have enjoyed today's show, don't hesitate to subscribe to us on YouTube and like our Facebook page for more of these SkillsCast sessions and, of course, all the latest model railway news in video and social media form too. Otherwise, thanks again for watching, and I'll see you next time. Take care.